All right. It's great to be with you guys again. It's great to be back in the great state of Michigan. Excited to be with you guys this summer. So as a child, I had a lot of traumatic experiences. And I'm still working through some of those as I'm teaching you today. But I think we can all relate to moments we look back at our past where we kind of just cringe a little bit, right? And one of those traumatic moments for me is in the form of middle school PE class. And maybe some of you already know where I'm going here. Among the smells of Axe body spray and, and boys who think they're just going to be the next Jackie Robinson and had no problem flaunting it came a skinny, nerdy middle school boy. And if you're still waking up with me this morning, yes, I'm referring to myself there. Well, I dreaded every sport in middle school PE class. There was none more dreaded, more nightmarish for me than America's favorite pastime, baseball. And something you should know about me is that I have the canned eye coordination of a toddler. And so when I'm instructed to take a piece of wood as thin as my arm and somehow swing it at just the right moment that a ball small enough to fit in the palm of my hand but heavy enough to take out a full-grown man comes straight at me, you best believe I was thinking, man, you know what? This is a piece of cake. Of course that's not what I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking of every horrible scenario in my head as the cocky middle school pitcher winds up that pitch, throws me a curveball, and of course, I miss it. And I don't just miss it. I miss it bad. I mean, I don't even think the ball left the pitcher's hand and I was already swinging the bat. That's how bad I missed it. And our middle school didn't have the mercy on guys like us to institute the regular three-strike system. No, 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 no. You just kept swinging that thing until you were hitting double digits. And the PE teacher, after a while, after maybe 20, 25, just, just misses. He's holding back laughter himself. He's like, all right, just get, off the, just get off the home plate. Save us all some time. And he calls the next person up to bat. And after that moment, every time I would begrudgingly get up to bed when it was my turn, I would hear the two most traumatic words any middle school boy wants to hear. Easy out. Easy out. And to this day, those two words still get to me. And while we hate to be on the receiving end of those two words, it can feel really good if you're the pitching team knowing your team can kind of catch a break, you don't need to be worried about a slam down center field or being prepared for somebody to steal a base. And in our own lives, we face all kinds of opponents, all sorts of problems that come up to bat in our lives. Maybe this is a person for you. And you're the pitcher and the batter, they are built and their arms are jacked and and they're staring menacingly into your eyes. And, and they're just swinging that bat, ready with such confidence. And you think, man, it does not matter how I pitch this ball to them. They will hit it, and it will not fare well for me. Maybe for you, that person is, a, is your boss, who just seems to make it their entire life mission to constantly criticize you and belittle you. And their menacing glances from home plate come in the form of criticism and belittlement. You don't have to be around them very long for you to start to question your competency. And it makes you feel like you're walking on eggshells around them. Or maybe for you, this person is an overbearing family member. No matter how much you try to talk to them about something, the conversation always turns to be about them, or they always seem to impose their opinions or the decisions on you, leaving you feeling powerless and frustrated. Or for you, it's not a person that's up to bat in your life, but maybe it's a situation. Perhaps this morning you're dealing with a mountain of debt or are drowning in financial insecurity. And every new bill or loan that you have to pay off is just another batter ready to throw off your game this morning. Or maybe your opponent is in the form of a stress you feel over a health struggle. Maybe what's stepping up to your plate in your life today is severe illness or chronic pain that makes life difficult for you. And it's putting a strain on your trust in God. Maybe for you, your opponent is a fear of failure whether as a husband or a wife, as a boss or an employee, you're constantly feeling like you might even be failing before God. And so you're constantly running your life through an assortment of litmus tests, trying to somehow make you feel better about the way that you're handling all of these things. And as we've been seeing, and as we've been going through the series of Joshua, I hope you've been able to see that the Israelites have had a series of opponents step up to the plate. 
Last week, Matt covered one of them specifically, the city of Jericho. And this was a city that was armed and fortified. It was kind of like the Fort Knox of Canaan. Joshua 6.1 says that the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Talk about intimidating, right? Before our main text today, though, we're going to be in Joshua 10. I want to briefly summarize what happens between chapter 6 and chapter 10. So following the victory after Jericho, Joshua sends men into the next Canaanite city that God wants them to take over. And this is the city of Ai, which is more like a tiny village when you compare it to the city of Jericho that they just destroyed. In chapter 7, we read that there was a little bit of a problem, though. There was a man by the name of Achan who took it upon himself when they were spying out the, the village of Ai. He decided to take some of their pagan idols for himself. And as a result, the Lord actually causes I to defeat the Israelites. This was a rare defeat. Now, this happens, but there is redemption by the end of the chapter. Achan is actually found out by some of his brothers. He's stoned for his actions. And the Lord actually accepts Joshua's plea for mercy on behalf of his people. Then in chapter 8, Joshua sends 30,000 men into, this, into the village of Ai, which, again, was a small village. So 30,000 people, small village, you, you can guess what happens here. They quickly overtake it. Another enemy that appeared to get them in the first couple of innings looked really intimidating coming to bat originally, but didn't stand a chance once the heavenly momentum was back on the Israelites' side. And by this point, the surrounding nations are starting to get really freaked out after both Jericho and I are handily destroyed. They know it's only a matter of time before they are next. And so in chapter 9, we hear about one of these nations and their plans to have the Israelites protect them instead of destroying them. And this is a plan that involves a little bit of some trickery, a little bit of master manipulation. This city is called Gibeon. And I, I won't go into too much detail here. Still, what you, what you need to know essentially is that the Gibeonites disguised themselves as weary travelers from a distant land who sought to make a covenant of peace with the Israelites. And it wasn't until three days after this covenant of peace was made that the Israelites found out that they were tricked, that the Gibeonites are actually their enemies. They're Canaanites. They deceived them. But because they had made the covenant of peace before God, they had to honor their new alliance. And so now we turn our eyes to Joshua 10, where God is ready to use these Israelites and their newfound alliance with the Gibeonites to fight against another major opposing team preparing to come up to bat. This time, the head person in the lineup, the, the sole batter right now, is the king of Jerusalem. His name is Adonai Zedek. And he's taken home plate. And outwardly, he looks intimidating, but inwardly, as we'll see, He's terrified, and so he gets his team together quick. And I think we can dissect Joshua 10 in the same way we can actually dissect an actual televised baseball game. Joshua's kind of spending the first half of the chapter here doing some pregame interviews. He's writing, he's observing the preparations of both of these teams going into the game. And then in the second half, we get a front row seat to the game. We get a front row seat to all the action, the war between the opposing Canaanite nations and Israel. And if there's anything I think this text teaches us, for those of you who might be filling out blanks this morning, if there's anything I think this text teaches us, it is that when God is on our team, the enemy is always an easy out. Again, when God is on our team, the enemy is always an easy out. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and open them up to Joshua 10. And as always, the verses will be up on the screens as well. Starting on verse 1. Here we go. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than I, and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent Hoham, king of Hebron, to Param, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and Israel's people. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. 
So in these first five verses, Joshua is kind of giving us a play-by-play of what's going on in the opponent's locker room. And we read that it's completely empty at first except for this one guy, Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem. And this Jerusalem is not the Jerusalem you read about in the New Testament or maybe even during the time of Jesus because Jerusalem actually used to be a Canaanite city. It used to be inhabited by these people called the Jebusites. This was a nation that was very hostile to the Israelites. It wouldn't be until later when King David would rule that they would take Jerusalem over. And we see that, like Gibeon, word has started to get around about how the Israelites were destroying every city in their path. Going into this game, the Israelite team is kind of undefeated, except for this little fluke here with I, but they are undefeated, essentially. In sports terms, they are the hot team right now. And not only that, but they've recruited some star players. And we read here in verse 2 that the Gibeonites were good fighters. This expression in Hebrew literally translates to mean mighty men and heroes. Going back to our baseball analogy, these men were star athletes. And even worse, they used to be on Adonai Zedek's team. Remember, they are Canaanites. And so going into this game, Adonai Zedek knows that if he doesn't recruit some key players, he's going to get absolutely embarrassed out there. And so what does he do? We read in verses 3 and 4. He, we read that he calls up some of the local rulers from some of the surrounding nations. In verse 4, he gives them this plan of attack. Come up to me and help me and and let us strike Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. So Adonai Zedek, kind of like how we see with some major league teams going into the playoffs when they know they're going to be facing some challenging opponents, what do they do? They start to recruit some star players. They believe that that the only way they will be able to overtake the Israelites is if they increase in number. He believes that the Israelites will become vulnerable if they can just get to, the, to get to the Gibeonites first, resulting in an easy out. And to be honest, this is all a direct result of fear. Friends, when we're fearful and we don't let God take control over our fears, asking him for peace and protection, we often circumvent that fear by doing whatever possible to defend ourselves. It's kind of our flight or fight or flight response. And we often choose to stay and fight to protect our ego and and our image. This is what Adonai Zedek does here. Instead of giving himself over to God's people, acknowledging that they are powerless and will forever be powerless against them because they have God on their team, instead of acknowledging who they are, he uses fear as a springboard to his own prideful motivations. It is in direct opposition to what we read about what Aaron taught about a couple weeks ago in Joshua chapter 2 with Rahab the prostitute. And if you remember correctly, Rahab was a citizen of Jericho who heard about the Israelites and she was afraid. Still, her fear was not like Adonai Zedek's fear. Her fear was not a fear of losing her ego and status and therefore feeling like she had to pridefully defend herself. No, her fear was a fear of the Lord. When Joshua sends spies into Jericho, Rahab goes against her people in Jericho by hiding the Israelite spies in her own home. She tells them in verse 9 of chapter 2, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. Her fear is fear that humbles her. Adonai Zedek's fear is fear that puffs him up. When fear leads to pride our first instinct is oftentimes to build up reinforcements to somehow defeat that which is threatening us. But if there's anything we should see from these first five verses, I think it's this. In God's eyes, quality is always greater than quantity. In God's eyes, quality is always greater than quantity. Unlike Adonai Zedek's first reaction, or or like Adonai Zedek's first reaction to his fear being to match the size and scale of the Gibeonites, when a problem steps up to play in our lives, when we don't see the problem through God's eyes, our first reaction is always going to be to quantify the issue, to let its size and scale overwhelm us. And so we might use phrases like this. This workload is massive. 
Or I'm dealing with an army of critics. There's an endless list of problems. The number of complaints I'm getting at work is too much. I can't keep up with it all. I'm overwhelmed. I'm drowning in stress. We quantify the issue and try to match its quantity by pridefully defending ourselves, fighting back against it. And we might do this in a variety of different, different ways. I'm gonna list out some of these here. It might be through overworking. That's the one that I struggle with the most, overworking, trying to outdo the scale of the problem by taking on more tasks, excessive tasks at work or at school or in your homes, which can lead to burnout. Or maybe for you, your toxic habit is micromanaging. You tell yourself, I need to be involved in every step of this process in order for me to feel at peace that it's being done correctly. Or maybe for you, this comes in the form of overreacting. You let the sheer size of the problem get the best of you, leading you to further escalate it, blowing it out of proportion to make it seem more manageable. You might say, hey, if they think that's an issue, I'll show them a real issue. As you can see, letting someone or something overwhelm you because outwardly it looks like too much is letting fear rule your hearts. And essentially, Adonai Zedek's desperate re recruitment of more men to fight off the Gibeonites is, is proving that he knows inwardly he knows he's no match. And so he thinks that somehow teaming up with others, building up a team will improve his odds as if God has a set limit on how much he can take. He seems to believe if I can only do this, if I can only get this much support for my team, God will not be able to win. But friends, the minute we put limits on God, thinking that we can somehow gain enough support, that somehow we tip the scales in our favor, is the minute we have underestimated the sovereign power of God. And as we'll see in the following few verses, that reigns true here. God is not intimidated by the size or the scale or the person or thing that has come up to bat in your lives. He's just not. Let's read on the following three verses, starting in verse six. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. And so Joshua went up from Gilgal. He and all the people of war were with them and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So now Joshua is panning the camera away from the opponent's locker room and gives us a glimpse of their own. The Gibeonites are now witnessing Adonai Zedek and his army of Amorites from all over the hill country encamping themselves around their city. And this was clearly unexpected. I mean, the Israelites weren't even staying with the Gibeonites. They were at another camp called Gilgal, away from the city of Gibeon. That's how unexpected this was. So, so the Gibeonites were forced to come up to Gilgal and eventually say to Joshua and the rest of the Israelites, hey, we have a ball game now. Because in their eyes, what didn't appear to be a threat at first has now become one. And that is because the Gibeonites did not follow God. And they fell into the same trap as Adonai Zedek. They became overwhelmed with the sheer size of the enemy. Instead of seeing the way that God values the quality of faith. And Joshua knows that they have to help their new partners in Gibeon. And we see here what God has to say to Joshua. Verse eight, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. This is essentially God telling Joshua what I've been trying to tell you. This is God telling them, hey, they may look intimidating in quantity, but they are an easy out because they are not with me. And despite the overwhelming number of enemy forces, despite Adonai Zedek's large numbers of reinforcements, leaving the Gibeonites feeling surrounded and trapped, Joshua and the Israelites have an advantage over the Am Amorites that far outweighs the size and numerical advantage. And their advantage is the quality of the support and favor of God. And this quality divinely given by God it ensures victory every single time. 
There is no tipping of the scales. God is not bound by the number or scale or size of an issue. When God is on our team, we don't have to fear anything that comes up to bat in our lives because the quality of having God on our team far outweighs the quantity of our issue. It far outweighs any quantification we might give to our problems. And this isn't God saying, don't worry, this is gonna be an easy win for you guys. No, as Matt so passionately laid out last week for us, God is saying here, don't worry because the game is already over. They will step foot onto this baseball diamond and they're gonna embarrass themselves before me. They are just waiting for the inevitable to happen. And in our own lives, friends, this is truer now than ever before because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The baseball game of our lives is already over. It would be like the defeated opponent of stress and anxiety about work or parenting or health concerns or an overbearing family member or a narcissistic coworker coming up to bat when the World Series of our lives is a landslide victory and family, we live in the celebration today and every day. The trophy of eternal life has already been handed to us and it's in our display cases. The firework celebration and parades are going on in our lives in the form of our worship and our praise to God. There is no chance for the opponent to overtake us when we live in the reality that we are on God's team. And when Satan tries to send players out to bat in our lives through any of the situations or scenarios I just mentioned earlier, he is sending them out onto an empty field where the lights are turned off and there's nobody in the stadium. There is no use. He is desperate for any affirmation, any glimpse of victory. But through Jesus' death and resurrection, he tells us, ignore them. Leave that to me. You go out and celebrate. I will stay here in this dark pitcher's mound and pitch for you. And don't hear me saying this is an excuse to get lazy, though. Friends, we still have a job we have to do. We have to live knowing that that victory has been won for us. And as some of you can attest, as you sit here in these seats right now, struggling with something in your lives, you know that is easier said than done. No matter how big the problem seems, no matter the sheer size or scale of the problem at bat, the truth about our victory in Christ still stands. And that, believing that, internalizing that in your lives, comes through faith through trusting that God is faithful to his word. Living in celebration and worship is easy when our lives is going well. But still, the minute we get captivated by the quantity of the problem over the quality of having God on the team is the minute we find ourselves right back onto that baseball diamond, thinking that we somehow have to secure our title. And when we do that, You know what we're doing? We're going right up to Jesus as he's pitching on our behalf and we take those pitcher gloves out of Jesus' hands and we tell him, Jesus, I know you've been doing this for me, but I've got it now. And when we do that, the Gibeonites are right. We do have a ball game. And this time it's not gonna be pretty for us. In the last half of chapter 10, Joshua gives us a glimpse at the game or as I should say, a lame excuse for a game because we see the physical manifestation of a game already won and the love God has for us and what he just said to Joshua here in verse eight. The game is already won and God has love for us and the fact that he has to keep pitching to a team that is already lost. And we all know that there are three strikes in baseball and in God's league as seen in the following verses, these three strikes come in the form of mass panic, hailstones, and a stopped sun and moon. Talk about a heavenly picture, am I right? We read in verse 10. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by way of the ascent of Beth Haran and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. Here's strike number one. An enemy once confident and menacing turned into a scrambling, mumbling embarrassment. This verse says that God chased them away and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. And I know those names just sound like a bunch of gibberish to you, so let me explain. Geographically, Makeda was over 25 miles away from where the battle was happening and had an elevation difference of over 1,000 feet. 
God chased them that far away. The enemy is that far away. And I think what this proves to us, guys, is that when God wants his enemies gone, he wants them gone for good. He ensured that they were well away from the Israelites and the Gibeonites so that they did not even dare think about returning. God can humble even the most arrogant of enemies when he is on our team. Reading on in verse 11, we see that as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. Here's strike number two. And this is not the first or last time that we read in scripture about God using hailstones as a form of divine punishment. Psalm 18, 12 says this. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through the clouds. And the Lord also thundered in the heavens and the most high uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And if there's anything this verse tells us in light of what we read here in Joshua 10, it is that these hailstones are a bold array of God's sovereign power and demonstrates that he always has the final judgment on our enemies. The rest of the verse in Joshua 10 says this, there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. In other words, we need to let God do the hard work for us. He's got hailstones, guys. We have nothing without him. Let him do the hard work for us. And now the moment of truth. For those of you who have, ne- who have ever studied Joshua 10 or read through it, this is what sticks out to you. This is why you read the chapter. And I know what all of you are thinking. Seth, just get to the part about Jesus stopping the sun and moon. This is what I'm curious about. Okay, here we go. Starting in verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Third and final strike. In this passage, Joshua is essentially asking God for a more extended day so that he can complete the defeat of the Amorites. And what follows is what a lot of us believe to be true, that somehow in God's sovereign authority, he stopped the sun and moon, elongating the day so that the Israelites could finish the job to the Amorites in daylight. Now, let me say, trying to study this is a process. Actually, when Matt assigned me this text after being so amazed, like, this is the sun and moon passage, this is sick. I thought, wait, what do do I believe about this? And trying to study this as a process, I mean, there's so many different theories about what might have happened here. Some believe that God maybe stopped the rotation of the earth. Some scholars believe that there was light from the sun that blocked, that was blocked kind of like an eclipse. Some believe it was poetic and mainly emphasizes the fact that God created the sun and moon and he can stop them. And so in the same way that the sun and moon have authority and submission to God, the, God's people have submission and authority to him as well. Explaining each of these theories, friends, would take all day. So let me offer you a humbler response. I don't know. And so I actually have a minute here in my manuscript. I'm just gonna take a second and pause. If you just wanna, if you're frustrated by that, you just wanna get up and leave the room, just just make sure you let my mom know when you pick your kid up why you're leaving. But genuinely, nobody knows, guys. But what I can say as I believe it definitely could have happened. I mean, if if God can raise Jesus from the dead, if he created the sun and the moon, I definitely believe that he can stop them, amen? amen? But what I think Joshua wants us to see from this third and final strike is this. We shouldn't allow the spectacle to shadow God's sovereignty. Look at verse 14. There has been no day like it before or since. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, Seth, there's been no day like it before or since when God stopped the sun and the moon. That is why this is so incredible. Not quite. Let's let's keep reading on. There has been no day like it before or since when God heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Wait, wait, what? Notice how this verse doesn't say there wasn't a day before or since when God stopped the sun and moon. That's not what this verse is saying. 
There has been no day before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Do you see what's happening here? I mean, it was just written that God stopped the sun and moon in their place and then they just go on and ultimately move on. It's like, yeah, that's cool, but let's talk about the more important issue. God heeded the voice of Joshua. And through Joshua's prayers to God, just as Matt talked about last week, God has won the victory. Let's not get so caught up in the spectacle of God stopping a sun and moon that we miss the power of our God. We miss the truth that saves us when we do that, that God fights for those who are on his team. Friends, in our own lives, do not get caught up in the seemingly miraculous things that might be done for you that you forget to thank God for his protection or his favor in your life. When you get a promotion at work, don't be so quick to attribute it to your hard work or spend too much time celebrating. In the excitement, don't forget to thank God for delivering you through a tough transition in your career. When God heals you from a severe illness, don't be quick to credit modern medicine or get so caught up in the joy of living in medical freedom that you forget to thank God and look at the way he was faithful through the entire process, through the doctors and physicians he entrusted to take care of you and and the medicine he provided for you. Don't allow the spectacle to shadow God's sovereignty. And God's sovereignty among the Israelites continues to prove itself in this victory. After the dust settles, the Israelites have advanced further on into their possession of the land that God had promised them. They have continued their conquest of the enemy territories that have come against them. And even though the event occurring here is said to be specific to Israel's history, it does not mean that God doesn't listen to our voices today. In fact, these verses should remind us that we need to be frequent and intentional in our prayers allowing our requests to God to be rooted in his promises for us as his children, just as Jesus promises his disciples in John chapter 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So friends, I don't know what's approaching your plate today. Whether it's a person, a situation, an emotion you're feeling as you sit here in these seats today. But what I see Jesus saying in these verses in John is that he so desperately wants to hear from you. He looks down at you saying, brother, sister, Ask for help in my name. Remove the pitching gloves and let me pitch for you. And friends, maybe you've been holding on to that pitching glove for far too long today, thinking that you, have, you alone have to battle the enemy that lies in front of you. But Jesus is reminding you through his sacrifice and resurrection that he has pitched your entire game for you. He knows every situation, every person, every every emotion that you will feel, that the enemy will desperately put up to bat in your lives. He knows every single one of them. And the enemy is just gonna hope that you take the bait. And as we move into this next time of communion, I would challenge you to ask God to give you a sense of clarity to remind you through the partaking of his blood and his body that the game is over. The opponents you face have no say in your game because they have already lost. So friends, as we move into this time of communion, the the altar is gonna be here if you need to pray and and just hear God's voice more clearly or if you need to stay in your seats or if you need to stand and worship, whatever posture you need to take in the next couple of minutes, we invite you to do that. We have communion elements on both sides here, but I would just invite you to take these words that Jesus tells his disciples here in John to heart. Live knowing your victory is already sealed because when you are on God's team, the enemy is always 
an easy out. Can I pray for you? Heavenly and gracious Father, God, we are just so grateful for you. Grateful for your, for your grace in our lives, evident through the cross of your son. But Lord God, I think overall, I'm reminded today of your sovereignty. Lord God, I know my brothers and sisters have a lot of things stepping up on their, on their plate right now. And, and they're confused. And, and they feel like they somehow, that their eternal life, maybe they still feel like that's in question. Maybe they've made some mistakes. Maybe they're just tired and exhausted. They just don't know what to do. And maybe they feel like they've lost. Maybe they feel like there's no hope. Maybe they feel like no matter how much they pray or how much they ask for help, they just feel like nothing's gonna come and nothing's gonna get better. But Lord God, through these verses, through the cross, as my brothers and sisters are sitting right now praying, probably holding these communion elements in their hands, there is victory through your blood and through your body. So Lord, as we go into this next time, whether it's taking a posture of kneeling and worship before you, as we bow down to your sovereignty, or as we take these communion elements, reminding ourselves how the victory is secured in us through your broken blood and body for us, through the death and resurrection and the cross, help us and remind us of that today. To live knowing that we are victorious in you. And Lord, we thank you for that. We can't thank you enough for that. So help us show the, that gratitude today as we move into this time now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.